<clears throat> okay. Let me, one second. All right, let me begin. Hello everyone, I am Pulum Brashidi. I'm a PhD student in the economics department in Princeton. Today, I'll be presenting individual and collective information acquisition, an experimental study. This is work joined with Alessandro Lizeri and Liat Yariv. They are, present, uh, they are present in the seminar, as well as Jimmy Chan and Wing Swan. And I was also pleasantly surprised to learn that Professor Kaysen will be the discussant of this paper. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion section. So to get into the theme of this project, consider some binary choice. Maybe there's some individual trying to decide which job to accept. Maybe there's a committee trying to figure out whether or not they should approve a drug. Or maybe there's a jury trying to figure out whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty. To tackle these situations, classical hypothesis testing will ha would have us collect a large body of data and only afterwards we've collected all this body of data, we would look at the data and we would be persuaded towards some A or towards some B and we would make a decision. However, in 1947, in comes Wald and says, we should be able to do better. And in fact, here's exactly how we can do better. You can start by posing your hypothesis, some A versus some B, and you can start collecting information sequentially. And you should keep on collecting information until you're sufficiently convinced towards A or towards B such that you can make a decision. And it can be shown theoretically that this will outperform. It will be more efficient than classical hypothesis testing. And the difference between these two different mechanisms is at the heart of our experiment we will have a three by two design in which we vary the setting between a dynamic one in which information arrives sequentially and decisions are made in time and a static one in which information arrives all in one go and only afterwards are decision made. We're also very interested to see how these different mechanisms interact with different institutions, which is why we have a design in which individuals alone make decisions, in which groups make decisions where the voting rule is majority, and one in which groups make decisions where the voting rule is <clears throat> unanimity. The information environment is very much in line with Dvoretsky, Kafer, and Wolfowitz. That is to say, you can think of this as in the outset, there's a jar A or jar B. One of them is chosen. Both have equal probability of being chosen. We tell our participants that, look, if they can guess correctly, they stand to gain $2. If not, they gain $0. Information more technically follows a continuous time wiener process, which is to say a continuous time random walk with a drift. The drift will be mu when jar A is selected, the drift will be minus mu when jar B is selected. The variance of the drift does not <clears throat> change uh, given the state. These are the parameter values we utilized in the experiment. And of course, information cannot be collected for free. At each moment of information collection, participants pay some fee, which adds up to about 40 cents a minute. Now, before I continue, a classic setup of this experiment would be something in line with, there's two jars, one of them has been selected. We would draw some balls from the jar, show them to the participants. In other words, give participants information. Then it would be up to them to map this information into posterior probabilities of A or B. And given those posterior probabilities, they would have to make a choice. However, there's a huge body of literature that emphasizes just how bad humans are at Bayesian updating. So we really didn't want to pollute our results with improper Bayesian updating. So we wanted a way around this. And this is what we came up with and what we implemented. This mechanism will allow us to feed the posterior probabilities directly <clears throat> to our participants. On the top here is the probability that state A is correct. It goes from zero all the way to 100. At the bottom, we see that the state B is the chosen state. It goes from zero all the way to 100. This dot here starts at the very middle, at the beginning of each game, meaning that state A and state B are exactly equally likely. Afterwards, this dot will dance around towards A or dance around towards B. It has a trend towards the correct state. This dot will follow exactly the Wiener process that we've translated into a probability of A or probability of B, albeit with a lot of noise. One thing is certain, if you're patient enough and you wait for a long enough time, this dot will converge to the true state. So this is the mechanism by which we feed the posterior probability directly to the participants. 
uh, the theoretical predictions uh, for the individual case are as follows. Until a decision has been made, information keeps on arriving until the individual chooses either A or B. Given the parameter values we use in the lab, theory predicts that to maximize expected returns, the participant should wait until the probability of either A or B becomes 0 0.81. For the group treatments, we have groups of three that are randomly formed after each round. Uh, again, participants can choose between waiting, choosing A, choosing B, and so on. For each participant, we use exactly the same parameter values. In other words, preferences are homogeneous. Theory predicts that the efficient outcome would be to mimic the individual outcome, which is to say to wait until 0 0.81, either towards A or either towards B. This is the interface. This is what our participants saw. At the top here, we remind our participants of the cost of collecting information. At the bottom, we remind them of the voting rule. You are now familiar with this part here. This is how we deliver information to the participants. Participants have three buttons. W is pressed at the beginning of the game. It stands for wait, and they can click on A to vote for A and click on B to vote for B. Here, participants can see how their group mates have voted. You will always be the green circle. Your group mates will always be the orange square or triangle. As it turns out from this picture, one person has already voted for A. So if this participant was also to vote for A, the green circle would move to A. Since the voting rule is majority, two out of three votes have been cast on A. A is implemented as the group guess. Instant feedback is given at the bottom with regard to whether the state was correct and what exactly was the payoff. <clears throat> what about the static, uh, static counterpart? Less is going on here. Participants are invited to input a number which stands for how many seconds to collect information, how much information they want to collect. Given the parameter values we use in the lab, uh, the optimal choice is about 30 seconds. Again, given that all the parameters are the same for each member, the optimal group choice is also to wait for about 30 seconds. This is the interface that uh, participants saw on the static treatment. Again, we remind them of the cost of information acquisition. We remind them of the voting rule, and we invite them to input a number here for how many seconds do they want to collect information. Once they do so, this is what they would see. Turns out one of the participants in the group chose 40, another chose 45, yet another one chose 42. Since the voting rule here is majority, uh, the 42 will be implemented as the group decision. The group will watch information uh, dance around, will watch information arrive for 42 seconds. Afterwards, if the information leans towards B, B is implemented. If it leans towards A, a is implemented, and once again, instant feedback is given at the end of every round. Experiments were run in Princeton Experimental Laboratory for the Social Sciences. Each participant participated in only one of the treatments. They played a total of 30 games plus two practice rounds. There was a total of 254 participants, and they earned, on average, $27 plus a $10 show-up fee. This is the breakdown of the participants in the different treatments. Okay, let's have a look at some of the results. This table pretty much summarizes the results I'll be talking about today, so let's start breaking it down. Remember, for the dynamic treatments, the theoretical prediction is with regard to the posterior until which the participants should wait, and that was 0 0.81 regardless of the treatment. What do we see in the data? Individuals are slightly less patient. On average, they cast their vote with a posterior of about 0 0.77. Majority, on average, the pivotal vote is even more uh, impatient. The pivotal vote is cast with, on average, about 0 0.73, whereas unanimity is roughly close to the optimal theoretical prediction. With regard to the static treatment, the theoretical prediction is with regard to how much information to be collected. And it was optimal to collect information for about 30 seconds. What do we see here? <clears throat> Regardless of the treatment, there's excessive information collection in all three treatments in the static uh, in the static setup with the least excessive information being collected under majority, but still well above what the optimal theoretical level is. So let's start breaking down these results in a bit more detail, starting by the dynamic treatment. 
When the individual and the individual treatment votes towards A or towards B, we record the posterior probability when that vote was cast, with what posterior did they vote. And the same when groups vote. When the pivotal vote is cast, the second vote towards A for majority or the third votes towards one of the states for uh, unanimity, we record what was the posterior when that vote was cast. These, of course, lead to different distributions. And we're showing you here the CDFs of those three distributions. And what do we see? We see that these CDFs are neatly stacked in the first order stochastic dominant sense, with the least patient being majority, followed by individual treatment, and the most patient or most demanding, if you will, is the unanimity treatment. Now, at this point, you should think, well, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that these uh, distributions differ. After all, if we created groups randomly, groups of three, think of unanimity <clears throat> for a decision to be made. The first person has to vote. Afterwards, the second person has to vote. It is not until the third person, the most demanding, the most patient vote, until she casts a vote, only then is the group decision made. In other words, it's the third order statistic that drives decisions under unanimity. Under majority, it's the second order statistic that drives decisions and so on. So of course, we expect to see some difference between these distributions. The question then is, is all we're seeing here this mechanical difference of voting in groups, or is there more going on? To tackle this question, here's what we've done. After we've collected all the data, we go to the individual level treatment, where people voted in isolation, all alone, and we simulate groups. What if they voted in a group? Afterwards, after we've collected the data, we create random groups of three from the individual level treatment. And to simulate unanimity, we look at the most demanding uh, vote in the groups of three, and we simulate unanimity. To simulate majority, we look at the second most demanding in these randomly formed groups, and we simulate majority. And this is what we see. <clears throat> Let me begin with the unanimity treatment. The dashed line, the dashed uh, purple line represents the simulated unanimity, whereas the full purple line represents the observed unanimity. As you can see, they barely differ from one another. In fact, the Kolmogorov Smirnov test fails to reject that these are one and the same distribution. In other words, yes, uh, unanimity is more demanding than the individual treatment, but only because of this mechanical effect that the most demanding person drives the decision making in that treatment. What about majority? The dashed orange graph represents the simulated or the expected uh, behavior of majority. And what we see, the observed behavior is way less patient than what we would have expected. Majority is very hasty in our data set. Now, there could be multiple theories that could explain why do we observe a uh, hasty majority. The one that we entertain or we've, uh, we, we think stands the best chance to explain this is what we label some kind of demand for agency. So let me explain what I mean by that. When individuals vote alone, you are the one who makes the call. There's no doubt about that. When individuals vote in groups under which the voting rule is unanimity, without each and every person casting a vote, a group decision cannot be made. In majority, however, the situation is different. You might be very patient, very demanding, but your colleagues, your two other group mates might be very impatient and they very quickly decide on A or B and decisions are made without your input at all. In fact, talking to participants after the experiment, they voiced exactly this concern. They said that sometimes they were hasty to make a decision because they wanted to be a part of the decision-making process. In the paper, we provide evidence of why we believe this might be the driving force of this hasty majority. But of course, there might be also other alternative theories that might explain this. I want to emphasize one more um, feature of the data and from the dynamic treatments uh, before I continue with the static treatments. Each column here is a regression, but let us focus on the final column. It will be sufficient for me to make my point. We take those posterior probabilities when the pivotal vote was cast. We regress those values on the pivotal uh, caster's uh, fixed effects, so on the idea of the pivotal caster. But more importantly, we regress them on the time trend. We allow for these votes to differ based on when they were cast. And we allow for a different time trend for individual treatment, major treatment, and unanimity treatment. And what we find is that the parameter value associated with time is negative and statistically significantly so. That means that 
we find evidence that the thresholds with which participants are voting or the standards with which participants vote decrease in time. An individual that says, I'm not willing to vote unless it's 85, after one minute passes says, well, you know what, 80 is not that bad. Another minute passes, now she might start even considering voting with 075 and so on. So we find evidence of decreasing standards in time. What about the static treatment? Again, I'm presenting here three CDFs that correspond to the individual majority and unanimity static treatments. In this case, they are with respect to how long was the pivotal vote? How much information did these groups collect? We see that the difference between the treatments is not as stark as it was in the dynamic treatment. However, we once more want to see whether this difference is due to mechanical effects or is there more going on. Once more, we simulate the expected uh, votes under unanimity and majority, and here are the expected ones. In this case, in the static case, both the majority observed differs from the majority simulated and unanimity differs from the unanimity simulated, meaning that there is more than just a mechanical effect going on when we go from individual voting to voting in groups. More importantly, again, we can just focus on the first column here, which is a regression for the static treatment. What we find is excessive information collection. The optimal level was about 30 seconds. We see that on average, there is about 41 seconds information collected in the individual treatment, slightly less in the majority, but again, much more than what the optimal theoretical prediction would be. Now I can finally um, compare the performance between unanimity, majority, and the different treatments. To do so, here's what we do. We normalize payoffs to one and we normalize costs to 0.0. .0. Two. And we aggregate the performance across all games within each treatment, and we create this here performance measure. The first thing that you should notice here is that any one of the dynamic treatments outperforms any one of the static treatments, and it, they do so very highly statistically significantly so. This is in line with what we said in the first uh, slide in line with Wald and in line with a large body of literature that claims that sequential information acquisition outperforms classical hypothesis testing. Furthermore, within the dynamic treatment, we see that the treatment that performs best is unanimity, whereas within the static treatment, we see that the treatment that performs best is the majority treatment. To see why this is the case, let me bring back this table from a couple of slides earlier. The prediction for uh, the dynamic treatment was for them to optimally wait until 0 0.81. The closest, closest treatment to this was the unanimity treatment, which is why unanimity on average outperforms the other two treatments. In the static treatment, everyone excessively collected information with the least excessive information collection being done by the uh, majority treatment which is why in the static treatment, majority outperforms the other two treatments. I believe I have about a, another minute left. Is there a question? Uh, no, no, just that you have a minute. Perfect, okay. So let me use this one minute to summarize. We are interested to see the difference between sequential information collection and classical hypothesis testing. We were also interested to see how this interacts with different institutions. And here's what we found. Under sequential sampling, we found evidence of decreasing uh, standards in time. As the game pro progresses, people become more and more willing to cast their vote with a lower and lower standard. Under static sampling, we found excessive information collection. We found that sequential information collection outperforms the static information collection very much in line with the theoretical predictions. Furthermore, with regards to the behavior of individuals and groups, we saw that going from individual voting to group voting typically has an effect that goes beyond just that mechanical effect of the first and second and third order statistic. And finally, we see that majority voting is hastier both under dynamic and under the static treatment with a particular focus on the dynamic treatment where we believe what might be driving these results is some sort of uh, demand for agency. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion section. Uh